Part 15. How to Deal with a Dragon The stuffer's shack on the edge of West Bellevue made Drek soy calf, but the view of Council Island was worth the extra couple of Nuyen Cat's crew pro-offered for each tepid cup. The decker stood at the edge of the parking lot, staring off at the distant island. Council Island was one of the last patches of green in Seattle. Once, she'd flown over New York and glimpsed the magically enhanced wilds of Central Park. It was a green brushstroke on a canvas of concrete. Cat imagined that people flying over Council Island must feel the same way. Interstate 90 knifed through the northern edge of the island, bracketed by heavily manned and armored security checkpoints. If everything went according to plan, their dock wagon uniforms and vehicle would get them through those checkpoints and one step closer to Artin. A dark thought flittered through Kat's imagination. What did anything go right in the shadows? She absently stroked the small kitten in her arms and instantly felt better. Kit soon touched her elbow. The shaman slid a thin arm around Kat's waist and laid her head on Kat's shoulder. It won't be long now. Then what? A vacation? I hear Hawaii is nice this time of year. Kat sighed and leaned into her friend. Truthfully, she'd never heard a thing about Hawaii, and outside of a working trip to London and that business in the Salish Shahid, she'd never spent real time outside of Seattle. Kit soon laughed. Her breath fogged the crisp Lake Washington air. Right. Like shadow runners know how to take vacations. A long shadow fell across the pair, followed by two somewhat shorter ones. R.C. threw an arm over the two women and rumbled. Yin for your thoughts? Kat smirked to herself, remembering how they all came together. The kind of jobs she did, expected to do, didn't require more than a decker, a samurai, and maybe a major shaman to handle the wizard stuff. The Atin job turned out to be more than she ever expected. She brought in a rigger, Hegemon, and even though he couldn't rig vehicles, his drones provided all the necessary fire support and spying capabilities imaginable. Still... It wasn't enough to meet the demands of the job. She considered handing out dock wagon contracts to everyone on her crew, finding a second rigger, one who worked behind the wheel, and even tracking down a cybered freak like Hatchet Man to fill out the rooster. Finally, she gave in to the demands and called in a physical adept, R.C., whose mystically enhanced martial abilities gave the crew the last element they needed to get the job done. I, I was just wondering where everyone is going to hide out after all this is over. JT quipped. What? We're still talking about heading to a second city? I mean, Seattle's shadows are so deep these days you could get lost in them, and no one would ever find you. Kit soon glanced at Hajimon before she answered. I thought about Chicago. I know this guy down there. Debian. Who says there's good work for shamans? I know someone down there too. JT kept going. An old chummer of mine, named Livingston, works for Ares Firewatch, and he says the bug problem was a lot more serious than they'll tell you on the trid. They lapsed into silence. Five shadow runners watching the cars zip by on I-90, considering the magnitude of what they were about to do. Cat looked to the clouds breaking apart over the Mount Rainier and thought of Dunkelzan. She hoped that all dragons weren't created equal. R.C. asked, What about Hong Kong? Hegemon countered, eyes trained on Kitsune. I don't know. I was thinking Berlin. But I don't know how things sit between Lofri and Artin. Hell. Killing the worm might be doing Lofi a favor. He shrugged. J.T. replied, Maybe we should get those Laguna Softs and head over to Italy. Italy? Cat 
Kitsune and Hegemon cried in unison. R.C. stared at the four of them, clearly confused. Hegemon joked, Florio said we're welcome any time. The group fell into an easy silence, and this time it stuck. Minutes later, a call came in over the dock wagon network. A platinum client was in cardiac distress at a private residence on Council Island. Without another thought, the team climbed into the dock wagon armored transport and rolled toward their destination. The thick concrete border checkpoint rose up quickly, and Cat stomped on the brakes. She eyed the scorch marks along the barriers where overzealous go-gangers had tested their manhood and failed. Auto cannons swiveled towards her from the edges of the road. Cat stopped the city master in front of a leathery security guard. The man wore the colors of the Sioux Army. He held one hand out, palm towards the vehicle, and the other arm cradled an AK-97. We have a medical emergency, sir. Let us through. Cat's heart thumped so loudly in her chest that she worried the guard would hear it. But he paid no attention to her thumping heart or her profuse sweating, instead asking for her ID and running it through the scanner, never breaking stern eye contact. Satisfied with the results, he stepped slowly aside and waved the truck through. Cat let out a short, satisfied chortle. Her hack job at Doc Wagon last night passed the first test, though the real hurdle was Atin's inevitable security force at the house. They knew nothing of the dragon's retina, or where they were going other than an address and the little information available on the tricks. She raced through the streets, sirens blazing. A quick five-minute drive brought her to the mouth of a forest clearing and the road leading to Atin. Are we ready? She called back to the others. Nobody answered. They didn't have to. Fluff sensed Cat's anxiety and crawled into her lap. Cat stroked the kitten gently and whispered the same mantra to Kitsune whispered to her. It won't be long now. Even without being comfortably jacked into the Matrix, Cat could feel the cameras on her. She eased up the road cautiously. It was unlined and the wide city master brushed past trees on either side. Finally, the wooded canopy fell away to reveal a grassy clearing and a lodge as long as a department store. Hegemon whistled his approval, settling into the seat next to her. Drones are ready to go? There were four Ares Guardian drones latched to the roof of the city master, the most the rigor could control with his gear. Ready. When you start the party, I'll signal them to start dancing. That should keep security off of us long enough to do what we came for. Cat gave a barely perceptible nod. Her gaze was locked on the building. It was massive. A mansion built out of cedar logs stacked horizontally from trees that were larger than the city master. Cat wasn't fooled by the rustic visage. She could almost hear the thrum of sophisticated electronic security ebbing from the house. She knew that even now their images were being processed. Somewhere inside, Atin's own deckers were combing through the dock wagon's secure databases to confirm her crew's identities at the root level. Fluff made a sound like a growl and started to pace, eventually trying to sneak into Cat's medical duffel. Not this time, Fluff. Cat pursed her lips into a tight frown. She shut the door on the kitten, and Fluff whined pitifully. She grabbed the metal briefcase she'd lifted from the Ares cache what seemed like months ago, kissed it, and dropped it on top of the gurney. Beside her, R.C. readied a long case, stamped with the bright red catechus symbol, often thought to represent health and long life. Cat had learned over the years that the symbol's real meaning was as dark as her own on this day. Cat rubbed her temple, thinking how the weapons and drones stuffed in among their gear went well beyond standard dog wagon protocol. A phalanx of security officers rushed out to meet them. We received a call that Mr. Marshall Parker is under duress inside. 
The lead officer had the look of a long-time soldier. He stared at her, unmoving. Sir, we need to get inside and get to our client now. At that, R.C. stepped forward with his case in hand. The security detail responded immediately, raising and cocking their submachine guns. The troll didn't flinch. He just raised a crooked middle finger and smiled. Sir, I don't know who you are, but my client paid us a lot of money to make sure he doesn't die. I hope your insurance and your host's insurance is fully paid up, because if he does die, the lawyers will be on you faster than ghoul on flesh. Now, I have the complete authority of Doc Wagon to go in there and get my client. Will you please step aside? It wasn't a question. Sweat pooled in Kat's armpits. She wasn't built for this. She was a decker. More at home in the Matrix than anywhere in the real world. It was only a matter of time before this soldier saw right through her. Why don't we bring him out to you? Don't you dare move him. Her heart crawled up into her throat. We have no idea what is causing his condition. And if you move him, you could do more damage or maybe even kill him. And I swear, if you... She caught herself. She was beginning to panic. For a moment, the only sounds were the wind moving through the trees. A faint scratching at the door of the city master, and Katz labored breathing. The lead officer cocked his head slightly, as if responding to an unheard command, and said, It seems you checked out, Miss Moore. Please, collect your gear and follow me. Hegemon led the way pushing the equipment-laden gurney down wide, twisting hallways. Kat and Kitsune followed, and R.C. brought up the rear. Kitsune turned to Kat and mouthed, Are you scared? Kat looked ahead. She didn't answer. They came to a large antechamber with monstrous bronze double doors set into one end. Ateen's security detail followed them to the door. The lead officer opened it. They saw the beast the moment they entered the great chamber. It hunched on four legs, as thick and long as maples. The five runners all stared up at it, awed by the size of the thing. Cat tried to move, but her breath caught in her throat. Her memory dragged her back to that night in Salish Shadid. She remembered the gold markings like tendrils of smoke crowding its snout. She remembered how it spread its deep red wings, and every star dotting the clear sky vanished behind them. From this distance, forty or fifty yards, the beast felt smaller, less like the shard of malice that tore her life apart. The beast's red skin looked duller than it had that night. Its snout had shed the markings she remembered. A thick row of ridges followed the curve of its back. Its eyes, blue and gold saucers, each the size of a child, flitted over her without a hint of recognition. Cat's eyes narrowed, and she stared back defiantly. A squat Nan woman, the beast's translator perhaps, stepped out of its shadow and started to say something. Cat tore an AK-97 from under the gurney and pointed it at the beast. She flicked the catch to full auto and squeezed the trigger. The dragon roared as the bullets slammed into its skin. Some found purchase, while others glanced off. Ateen glared down at Cat with cold hatred, but still not a hint of recognition. Cat screamed, You don't remember me, do you, Slitch? Well, you won't live long enough to forget me again. R.C.'s case fell away to reveal an RPG. He hefted it to his shoulder and fired. The dragon leaped into the air, wings spread wide. It banked against the curve of the ceiling. The ground began to shake with the power of Ateen's magic. J.T. sucked in air and choked out, Here we go!